can you give me kind of your thoughts around how generally the contraceptive pill can affect anything from mood to performance? Because for me, I was the reason why I, and this might go into another conversation, the reason why I went on the pill when I was 16 was because of my period and I wanted my period to stop. And I didn't want my, I had really bad periods and I didn't want them to carry on. And I didn't really understand about my periods, but I hated them. I absolutely hated them. And then when I was modeling, I mean, who wants a period when they're modeling? So having no period is the best thing in the world for me back then. Now, dangerous. Um, So I lived like that for a very, very long time. And now I'm very passionate about having this conversation and understanding the pill in its form so people can make their own informed decision from a place of, you know, informative knowledge. So can you give your thoughts on contraceptive pill for mood and performance and and just general health? Yeah, I mean, the pill is experimental in its own right. I mean, it was just the, earlier this year where they are looking at brain changes on young versus older um, women on the pill. And they saw that, yeah, you had a shrink of the amygdala and we had an increase in fear and anxiety, which is reversible in adults, but they don't know if it's reversible in younger girls because it's the time of brain development, right? We also know that across a natural menstrual cycle, you have areas of brain that changes because of the influence of hormones. But when we look at the OC, because the formulation hasn't, I shouldn't say it hasn't changed, the concept of it hasn't changed, where we look at the placebo pill week, it was really put in there by men who were designing the pill to say, hey, yeah, now a woman feels like she's having a period. It was women behind it who had the idea, but they didn't have access to the lab to actually do it because they weren't allowed to be in there. So when we look at that sugar pill week, it was put in there and people still think it's a period. Like you'll still have GPs who are like, oh, we'll, we'll regulate your period by putting you on the pill, but it's not. It's like it's a withdrawal blade and it down regulates your own ovarian function. And because it's so experimental, like I have a hard time with the, the ongoing blanket. Like if you have problems with your period or you have problems with your skin, you go to your GP and they're like, here's an oral contraceptive pill, right? Because there's so many other things that we can do first. Let's dig in and see what's going on. Why are we having irregular periods? Are you in the first few years of starting to menstruate? Well, yes, we're going to have lots of variability and let's see how that shakes out. Or are you having a lot of polyps or something to that effect that we can take care of? Maybe we need to look at using an IUD, or maybe we have to look at using pomegranate extract to reduce heavy menstrual bleeding. There's so many different things that we can do. Yeah. It's that was a one. better than, yeah, it's better than tranonitmic acid. Is that what it's called? The uh, blood clotting drug oh, that yeah. they put people on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So there's lots of things within it that people don't understand. And I also put, you know, you go and you have all these teenage girls are put on the pill, not for contraceptive reasons, but for other reasons, which I find is a, it's like, here's some Skittles, right? But then the other side of the coin with all these women who are going with perimenopausal symptoms and going, oh, here's MHD, like without really understanding what that's doing and how that affects the individual. So it's both ends of the spectrum. And I want people to understand that the OC is not representative of your own endocrine system. It downregulates it. It downregulates it from a brain perspective. And depending on the formulation, is it what generation the progestin is? It has different effects. Is it more androgenic? Is it more estrogenic? We don't know. Depends on how it affects your body. So it's really making the choice with someone who's informed about the the formulations of the pills which I don't if know you if people are, know, even know who that would be, by the way, hence I'm asking the question. Because if you go to the yeah. doctor, it will be, just have this. Yeah, endocrinologists, but there's also some really good um, websites of, of like alloy for women who are in the States. You can get OCs or MHT, and they give you a really deep dive in the education. I think also it all comes down to, we don't educate our girls around what the menstrual cycle is. We say, oh, here's textbook. It's 21 to 35 days, but we don't talk about ovulation. We don't talk about a bleed pattern and how that might change. We don't talk about what is normal for you as an individual and how you track your own normal. Like those are all the conversations that are not being had. So when a girl starts menstruating and having issues and she thinks that it's not normal, 
So she goes to a physician and a physician's like, you're outside of the textbook norm. Let's put you on a pill. But in fact, it might be her normal as long as it's not interfering with your daily life, which sounds like you were having significant issues with bleeding, right? That's something to investigate. But there's so many girls who are going in because of poor skin or something else. And it's like, that's not appropriate. We should have moved past that by now. I think it's such a big topic of conversation. I've been off the pill now for six years. And Yay. It, I know, yeah. And it was one of those moments where I thought, oh my gosh, I've been on it for 15 years, you know, nearly. Like it's it's a long time. And I felt as a woman very disconnected from my body. I'm sure my sister wouldn't mind saying this. She's eight years older than me and she's going through perimenopause. The first thing the doctor did was put her back on the pill. Um, it's not obviously because of contraception, Nope. It's to control the symptomology, but there's so many other things you can do that are natural. And we, I put people in this scenario. I'm like, this is the, the common medical view of a woman's reproductive years. You're 13 or 14, you start menstruating, your periods are a bit uh, irregular, or you have lots of variability. Let's put you on an OC to kind of control that. And you're going through all the way up till your late twenties. And then you're like, Oh, I might have, a, I want to try to have a kid. So you come off it, you get pregnant and you have one kid and then you immediately go on the progestin only mini pill. Cause that's safe when you're breastfeeding. Right. Yep. And then you transit transition off that onto another combined oral contraceptive pill, which you're used to. And then you decide you might want to have another kid or not. And you do the same thing. And then you get into your mid forties and you're like, Oh, perimenopause, maybe I should be, you know, thinking about that. And you go talk to your physician and like, no, no, stay on it until you go on MHT. So the whole time, like from a medical perspective, a woman's whole body is being controlled from exogenous hormones. And as a physiologist, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can just like, if you've ever seen the queen's gambit, when she looks up at the ceiling and she sees the chest pieces moving, that's yeah. how I see cellular functions. So I look and I'm like, Oh my gosh, all these exogenous hormones that have different molecular structures and how they affect our, our receptors differently from our natural ones and all the things that could possibly go wrong. I'm surprised that people are allowed to start on something that when they're 14 and go all the way through till they're 80. And it just blows my mind that other people don't think that way. <laughs> but it's the subculture that we've been living in. And I think if we actually break this down to everything, I think there is a place for everything in a world, but not as the, always the first resort. And I even say this with SSRIs, with some people, it's been completely life-changing and it's, it's, it's saved people. And it has been the only route that's been helpful. Others are given that without looking at diet, looking at lifestyle factors, looking at environmental factors, looking at the stress that's in their life, like looking at other factors first and then knowing that there's also this secondary factor that you can put in, I think is a conversation that like we just don't have around our health. There's, there's no preventative health. <laughs> it's, no, there isn't. Let's just no. like put a plaster on it until the plaster comes off and then we'll put another one on. And I, I mean, I blame the US health system because it's a for-profit system, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like New Zealand was more socialized. Yeah. And so that's what's driving it is money, right? So why would we educate people about how not to use drugs? Because then we might not make money. It's so true. Why would we look after our health when we can like drug our I know. health? It's crazy. We could be I dope know. sick. And, like then, documentary and then make money. Up. Oh yeah, that's right. And then we can make money on yeah. surgeries. Exactly.